We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombings, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, the mainstream media, social justice, critical race theory, COVID-19, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with it. No one has any vision of a different, or a better kind of future. This is a story about how over the past 40 years, politicians, finances and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead they constructed a simpler version of the world, in order to hang on to power. And as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. Even those who thought they were attacking the system, the radicals, the artists, the musicians, and our whole counterculture, actually became part of the trickery. Because they too have retreated into the make-believe world, which is why their opposition has no effect, and nothing ever changes. But this retreat into a dream world, allowed dark and destructive forces to fester and grow outside. Forces that are now returning to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. People in Britain and America now began to turn away from politics. The effect of the Iraq war had been very powerful. Not only did millions of people feel that they had been lied to over the weapons of mass destruction, but there was a deeper feeling that whatever they did or said had no effect, that despite the mass protests and the fears and the warnings, the war had happened anyway. Liberals, radicals, and a whole new generation of young people were treated. They turned instead to another world that was free of this hypocrisy and the corruption of politics. They went into cyberspace. Cyberspace had become even more sophisticated and responsive to human interaction. The online world was full of algorithms that could analyze and predict human behavior. The man behind much of this was a scientist named Judea Pearl. He was the godfather of modern artificial intelligence. Pearl's breakthrough had been to utilize a revolutionary new probabilistic graphical model known as a Bayesian belief network. These networks represented a set of variables and their conditional dependencies via a directed acyclic graph. The power from these models made it possible for systems that could predict behavior even when the information was incomplete. But to make the system work, Pearl and others had imported a model of human beings drawn from economics. They had created what were called rational agents, software that mimicked human beings, but in a very simplified form. The model assumed that the agent would always act rationally in order to get what it wants. One of the early utopians of cyberspace, Jaron Lanier, warned of the implications this new kind of cyberspace would have in the real world. The agent's model of what you are interested in would always be a cartoon. And in return, you will see a cartoon version of the world through the agent's eyes. And, he added, it will never be clear who they are working for. You or someone else entirely. New technology began to allow people to upload millions of images and videos into cyberspace. And the web, which up to that point seemed like an abstract other world, began to look and feel like the real world. 
from videos of animals and personal experiences to extraordinary events and horrific nightmares. All of it was to be uploaded for all the world to see. However, in a strange and horrific twist, the first terrorist beheading video that was posted online was that of Judea Pearl's own son. He was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal and had been kidnapped by radical Islamists in Pakistan. They recorded what they said was his confession and then his killing. This was a new world that the old systems of power found very difficult to deal with in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. The security agencies secretly collected data from millions of people online. One of these data collection programs was called Optic Nerve. It took stills from the webcam conversations of millions of people across the world, trying to spot terrorists planning another attack. The program did not discover a single terrorist, but it did discover something else. It would appear that a surprising number of people are using webcam conversations to show intimate parts of their body to each other. But increasingly people were using the internet in other ways to present themselves as they wanted to be seen. The web drew people in because it was mesmerizing. It was somewhere that you could explore and get lost in, in any way you wanted. But behind the screen, liking a two-way mirror, those same rational agents were watching and predicting, while guiding your hand on the mouse. These intelligent systems continued to gather ever more data. New forms of guidance began to take root and a new form of guided control was born. Social media. Complex algorithms looked at what individuals liked and then fed more of the same. In the process, individuals began to move without noticing into bubbles that isolated them from enormous amounts of other information. They only heard and saw what they liked and their newsfeeds increasingly excluded anything that might challenge people's pre-existing beliefs. The version of cyberspace that was rising up seemed to be very much like William Gibson's original vision. But behind the superficial freedoms of the internet were a few giant corporations. Their algorithmic systems controlled what people saw and shaped what they thought. What was even more mysterious was how they made decisions about what you should like, what should be hidden from you, and what should not be shown at all to anyone. And the algorithms used by those massive corporations to curate our make-believe world were not just created from thin air. They were created by testing and experimenting on us, the user. Not many knew at the time, but companies like Facebook had begun to run experiments on its users. By manipulating their news feed, they were able to shift the user's mood from one extreme to another. Around 2014, an article was published by The Guardian that outlined something Facebook had done unbeknownst to their users. For one, everyone had a Facebook profile, even those that did not sign up to the website. Facebook used its algorithms to find people who had not signed up by finding connections via phone contacts and image tags. These connections were used to create a shadow profile of those who had not created their own profile. And most of us still have no idea this is happening. 
but this led to them conducting experiments on its users, trying to find out how much control those news feeds had on their emotion. Facebook claimed the massive psychological experiment it secretly conducted on its users should have been done differently. Shortly afterward they published a new set of guidelines for how it would approach future research studies. However, Mike Schroepfer, chief technology officer, said the company had been unprepared for the negative reactions it received when it published the results of its experiment. And while watchdog groups and concerned experts condemned their efforts in studying the psychological effects of social media, Facebook continued to conduct their research projects with little public ire. It was then in 2012 that Facebook published a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Unbeknown to users, Facebook had tampered with the news feeds of nearly 700,000 people, showing them an abnormally low number of either positive or negative posts. The experiment aimed to determine whether the company could alter the emotional state of its users. But this was just the beginning. They also conducted other experiments that were made public by Forbes in 2014. They found that emotions could be contagious. When positive expressions in a user's newsfeed were reduced, they reacted by producing fewer positive posts and increased their negative posts. When negative expressions were reduced, the opposite pattern occurred, according to the paper published by the Facebook research team in the NERS. They concluded by asserting that emotions expressed by others on Facebook influence our own emotions, constituting experimental evidence for massive-scale contagion via social networks. The experiment ran for a week from January 11th to the 18th in 2012, during which the hundreds of thousands of Facebook users unknowingly participating may have felt either happier or more depressed than usual, as they saw either more of their friends posting things like 15 photos that restore our faith in humanity articles, or despondent status updates about losing jobs, getting screwed over by an airline, or already failing to live up to New Year's resolutions. From rumor cascades to self-censorship, selection effects in online sharing to social influence in social advertising, Facebook conducted many experiments, many of which are not even known to the public. They even conducted a 61 million person experiment in social influence and political mobilization. The results of which proved how much influence these corporations now had on politics all across the planet. But most worrying of all, in 2010 they offered test subjects an I voted button at the top of their news feeds, and included information on how to find their local polling place. Some users were also shown the names of their friends who had clicked the button too. As for the control group, they got no prompt to vote. Once they collected the necessary data, the researchers checked public voting records to see which of the millions actually voted. This experiment confirmed the idea that peer pressure works. People were more likely to click the I voted button if their friends' names appeared there. And when researchers checked actual voting records, they found that people who got the I voted message in their news feed were 0.39% more likely to have actually voted. Thus they were more likely to have voted if their friends' names appeared as well. It might be a minuscule percentage, but the researchers think their experiment resulted in 340,000 votes that wouldn't have otherwise happened. This was the point at which Facebook could identify the effects of their algorithms on a massive scale. Millions of profiles, demographics, locations, and personalities were now available to improve their algorithms via machine learning. What is known as an unsupervised learning algorithm? These algorithms take a set of data that contains only inputs, and attempt to find structure within the data, like a grouping or clustering of data points. The algorithms, therefore, learn from test data that has not been labeled, classified or categorized. Instead of responding to feedback, Unsupervised learning algorithms identify commonalities in the data and react based on the presence or absence of such commonalities in each new piece of data. 
It was this kind of prediction that gave these social media corporations their immense power and social influence. With these algorithms, and to the benefit of advertisers, Facebook could predict what kind of product you would want or need before you even knew you wanted it. It is estimated that 5.27 billion people now use a cell phone, more than half of which can use the Facebook app. This gives Facebook access to more than a billion unique profiles to test their algorithms with. And the sheer amount of data gives them the ability to accurately predict when you use the bathroom, or go to bed, or go to work. Every moment you have your phone on you is tracked and catalogued into a larger network that can now be manipulated without anyone noticing. A hidden network, used by millions, understood by only a few, now fed us our news, media, entertainment, and gossip. The conversations we had with one another began to expand it exponentially, such as celebrities conversing with their fans. But now politicians had begun to see the power in social media. They began creating profiles on another tech giant, Twitter. Now instead of sending a letter to your local politician, you could communicate with them directly. But this left the politicians vulnerable to the same psychological manipulation. First these corporations discovered new methods to get more people to vote, now they had the power to manipulate the emotions of the very same politicians being voted for.